Hello, everyone. Welcome back from our break. I hope you were able to uh, get some hydration, take a few deep breaths. And we have a wonderful panel lineup for you guys. We have some questions we're going to be discussing um, educational trends and also get a little bit of a behind the scenes sneak peek into what the publishing industry is like for an ed tech situation and um, how, you know, how these materials are born really. So I'm really excited today to have Ben, our founder and CEO. You met him earlier at our welcome session. He founded ESL Library in 2002. And today he's gonna to be serving as our expert on the panel about education technology, just the educational technology world in general. Tara is also going to be joining us. She was here for our coffee talk this morning. You met her. She's the head of our publishing at ESL Library. She has been in the publishing industry for 18 years and she's going to be serving as our expert on materials development for the language education industry. And we're also joined with La Robin Lockwood. She is new to us today, so we're so happy to have her here. She is a professor at Stanford. She works in the foreign language department. She teaches English and she's also been doing teacher training for quite a while. I think over 15 years. Did I get that right, Robin? <laughs> great. So she's going to be our panel expert today on language teaching. So we have a great lineup of people. I'll be here as our facilitator for the conversation. I'm going to get out of being in this big view, see if I can make us all equal size here. Yeah, that looks pretty good. And let's have a little conversation about language education trends. Um, what, what do we need to know? Um, I think let's start with Tara, if you don't mind that. Tara, I'll put you on the spot. Yeah. Uh, Tara, you've been in the language publishing community. You've been working at ESL Library from almost the beginning. Um, what are the trends that you are seeing in the publishing space? We've had a lot of conversations in the chat about this, and uh, I'm just interested to hear your perspective. Yeah, for sure. Oh, we're always watching the trends. Um, I love to see what's going on. We love to attend conferences like this and just, um, you know, figure out what all the teachers are looking for. Um, right now, one of the biggest trends, especially, you know, just since COVID started was digital literacy. So there's just been so much of a need for that. Um, teachers were forced to come online and teach their classes. Students were forced to come online and start learning and figuring out how to use Zoom and all these different types of tools for um, language learning. I'm excited that language learning continued. We just really didn't know what was gonna happen when it first hit. We were just, we had no clue. So we we were excited to be in one of those industries that actually wasn't, wasn't affected in terms of it stopped, you know, like so many other industries, but um, publishing just actually boomed, um, especially for online materials. So digital literacy was one of the biggest ones. Um, customized learning. So teachers want to be able to just pick and choose and mix and match and they don't want just this one size fits all. Um, so that's a really big trend right now. Um, authentic materials. So teachers are looking for materials that students um, find relevant. They can use this content and understand how to have conversations in real life. Um, so that's one thing we've done with our Washington Post section is, you know, bring in these authentic materials. We can grade them to lower levels, but um, we also have content for uh, advanced learners. So that's a, that's a big one right now, authentic materials. Um, formative assessment more than summative assessment, which, you know, is not really how it used to be, but I think uh, we're really happy about that here at ESL Library. It's kind of a um, summative assessment. You know, we, we haven't got too involved in that area of uh, ESL. So um, we're pretty excited about that. Um, gamification is, a, is like a really big one. A lot of publishers are trying to get into that, that um, realm. Um, and definitely inclusivity and diversity. So our editors are always going to inclusive webinars to learn more about how we can make sure our materials are great for all types of learners, all levels from all different countries. Um, and that brings us to social emotional learning, which we were just talking about 
um, today. It's kind of our theme of the day. So that's that's the hot topic right now. Uh, for a while, it was STEM. Um, definitely, you know, we were working on our STEM collection for a few years and academic language. But right now, um, social emotional learning is one of the big academic subjects. So those are some of them for sure. I saw someone just asked a question. What do you think about the trend towards test prep? Mm, well, <laughs> I alluded to that briefly. It's interesting you asked that. Um, that's how I got into ESL Library was to get out of test prep because that's how I got my start in uh, materials writing. I used to write TOEIC and TOEFL prep and train editors on that. And um, I really needed a break from it. I needed some social emotional health. Um, I remember putting my ETS textbook under my bed and I was like, I'm done. I'm going to write discovery um, lesson plans for English Avenue, which was um, ESL Library's Young Learner site at the time. So, but test prep, obviously, it's, it's not going anywhere. Um, it's something that we still need to keep in mind, but it's not something that is kind of our baby here at ESL Library. I'm seeing some uh, empathizing with you in the chat as well. <laughs> All right, let's ask um, Ben. Ben, from a educational technology perspective, the market, um, what trends are you seeing in the ed tech space? Um, well, actually, by the way, before I answer that question, I just wanted to note that uh, Tara's got those um, tiles on her wall there. In case anybody's wondering what those are, those are um, uh, those are all the names of people that work at ESL Library. So I think she started this last year uh, in uh, at the beginning of this or the beginning of this current year, and it seems to have grown quite a bit. Um, a, about a year and a half ago, we were about 15 people at the company. Now we're closer to 40, and um, so she uh, her wall is really filling up. But just in case anybody was curious about what's going on there behind her, that's what it is. Everybody there is somebody who works at the company. It's pretty neat. Um, what was your question again? <laughs> Sorry, I totally went off on a different, different No, I think that's good to point out all the cool things behind us because it can be a little distracting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question was about in the ed tech space, what kinds of trends are you seeing? Um, well, I, I, this is what I sort of touched on a little bit yesterday too in my first presentation is that there used to be this... Um, uh, I think a trend towards uh, in ed tech towards self-study uh, and a lot of uh, companies were trying to get into platforms that allowed people to just sort of work on their own and what seems to be sort of coming full circle now is that there's a trend towards empowering uh, the teacher uh, with better tools and to stay out of the way when when technology is not needed um, one of the things that really um, made me nervous about uh, technology in a language learning classroom a few years ago was as we started to see more and more um, self-study type apps appear in language learning. Um, my fear was that they would make their way into the classrooms too and you would suddenly get a lot of people um, just on devices by themselves uh, studying by themselves and that it would become just a bit of a, a, a too convenient of a, of a tool that would just let students work on their own and as a result um, all this interaction between students which is so important in a language learning classroom to get up to walk around to converse with somebody else and to practice with somebody else uh, that that would be sort of um, lost uh, through technology and um, what does seem to be happening now is there's a trend backwards uh, not backwards but progressively forward uh, but where we should have been from the beginning which is to um, build tools that enable teachers, enable language teachers to just do a better job. Uh, whether that's better broadcasting tools to be able to broadcast content quickly and more efficiently on, on the overhead projector, whether it's to be able to push assignments and paired activities to students in the classroom, uh, whether it's to plan and prepare your classes and get organized for your classes. There seems to be a trend now towards helping teachers with better insights and better tools. And that's where I think really, um, and I think that's a good thing because um, sometimes technology goes in a way that is not uh, necessarily good. I think right now we're headed in a direction where um, uh, a lot of technology companies are um, really um, in tune to this idea of, of doing something better for the teacher first. Yeah, I'm seeing some comments in the chat here that um, someone, men Jen, mentions that she had a similar fear, um, but the pandemic's highlighted the, how important social interaction is for learning. So yeah. 
that, that's that's so true and i think that um you know it could have gone the opposite way but i think that um uh, another good thing that's come of the pandemic uh, um is that it has i think brought people more together uh, people are there's a lot more conversations going on online and uh, there's a lot more conversations in the classroom there's more tools even like breakout rooms um which didn't exist before um and it was just sort of like a one-way track of somebody giving a lecture on zoom or one person speaking at a time um things like breakout rooms uh, have a huge advantage or, or give a huge advantage to a language learning classroom uh, in particular where you can put students in pairs or groups and have them facilitate a conversation there and i think who was it was it uh, russell yesterday was mentioning that in the in zoom now you can not only do a breakout room but you can also push um, a screen share to each of those breakout rooms which is really great so you can sort of help control the narrative in there but give a freer opportunity for people to practice right absolutely you're facilitating that um, conversation across all of your students and uh, building that supporting that social interaction exactly all right um robin you know you're an instructor at stanford you're working with the latest education trends um what topics you know we have teachers of all levels of experience complete newbies as someone's commenting in the chat there you know to teachers who have had years and years of experience so what are the topics that are increasing in popularity right now and what do we need to know that's new in the language education space uh well i think there's a couple of things that have come to the forefront maybe again and that would be flipped learning and blended learning um, i was flipping my classes a long time ago um, for some of these reasons to, you know, to address some things that Tara and Ben both said, you know, to have this student-centered classroom and interaction, right? We, we all needed classrooms that had social interaction and, and flipping my classrooms allowed me to do that. When we all had to pivot to online learning very quickly, flip learning became a very good way for all of us to keep doing what we were doing and keep doing it well. Um, so I think there's a big move again toward flip learning and blended learning. But some other trends that I've noticed and things that I've been using in my own classroom, um, design thinking has become a really popular uh, method to teach language. And it, I mean, it's used in other fields as well, but it's become very prominent in, in language classrooms. So design thinking and project-based learning, um, which is an, a really nice method to kind of get students really engaged in real world and hopefully personal, uh, personally meaningful projects. And both of those, whether you flip your classroom or not, those get students engaged in the learning, helps you form relationships with the students, which is something I think we've had to maybe even work a little harder at since we've all been online. Um, kind of developing that relationship between, not just between teachers and students, but students with other students, um, since they're not sitting next to each other. And I think, you know, two other things that I've kind of noticed over the, you know, the past year and two, year or two is critical thinking. Again, not a new topic, but one that's become more important over the past year or two. And 21st century skills. Those are both, I, I think, really big trends. Um, making sure that we teach critical thinking and allowing enough chances for our students to practice those. Um, and again, doing you know team projects and collaborative uh, collaborative projects that we can do that through any of those trends: design thinking, project based learning, flip learning. Um, so we really have a lot of flexibility as teachers. We just need to be able to kind of look at at these different methods and choose the one that works best for our students. And Robin, you mentioned design um, design thinking. Would you mind explaining just briefly what that is? I think that might be a new term for some of us. Sure. So design thinking actually is kind of started in the business world and is very prominent in the business world still. Um, but there's kind of it has five stages to design thinking, and you kind of walk the students through these different stages. You create like a project of sorts, and students then work their way through these five stages which is empathizing, right? So first getting students to feel something, to kind of understand the problem that they're trying to solve. Um, the second stage is defining, right? Where we try to figure out exactly what the person, what the user's needs are, what the problem is. So think of um, a business person who's creating a new product. What is that product going to solve for the person? Um, stage number three, 
um, is defining, or no, I'm sorry, I just said defining. Defining is number two. Um, stage three is where we kind of brainstorm and um, create, ideate is actually the name of the stage, creating the idea, actually starting to think about what a product would be or what a solution would be. Stage four is the prototype. This is where students start to create solutions for whatever problem or whatever product you're having them create. Um, think again in business, if you are a computer company, this is where they create you know, the beta version or maybe the alpha version where they first start to actually create a product. And then stage five is testing where we test out our solutions and make sure that they work. <laughs> Thanks, I sort of put you on the spot there. <laughs> That's okay. So basically, um, like you said, it, it's kind of mimicking what people do in like a business in a workplace. And people are bringing those ideas of what you do in a workplace into a classroom and having students kind of uh, mimic that process as well. So it's, is it like a form of project-based learning or is it related to that? Was it born from that? Oh, I don't know which, that's maybe a chicken and an egg kind of question. I'm not sure which came first. Um, to me, as a teacher, they're similar, right? There's kind of some different stages. Um, in project-based learning, that's more teacher-driven, right? So to, maybe if I kind of try to differentiate them, project-based learning tends to explore a relatively narrow area. And the teacher usually provides a very specific essential question for students to answer, right? Like here's the problem, now solve it. Design thinking is a little broader or wider um, where students can maybe explore more than one area of a potential problem. There's not necessarily just one question for students to answer. It might be like, how do we solve the problem of poverty? Not that, right. I mean, that's a very broad question, but then students can explore a lot of different ways to do that. Whereas in project-based learning, there would be a very specific question. Okay, that's a little more authentic in a way. It's what happens in real life. Like here's a problem and then everyone needs to think about how to solve it and start building solutions. Whereas with project-based learning, maybe the teacher just says, here's the project and go. Here's it. Yeah, right, that's exactly it. And in project-based learning, right, I supply the question and I supply the final product, right? Everybody's gonna produce a poster. Everybody's gonna write a report. Everybody's gonna write an essay. Whereas in design thinking, students actually like create something more physical and it might not be the same thing, right? So if you have them solving some sort of problem or creating a product that they think will sell, like if you're teaching marketing or business words, you know, if I have English for business students, they might all create a completely different product. It's not necessarily going to be the same thing. So that's so helpful. I, I feel like, you know, as a materials writer and our editors are listening in here and we've we've got a group project section that we really based on project based learning. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of Canadian teachers that work in the CLB program and they want all real world tasks. And I think this would be a really great thing for us to, you know, try out on our in our group project section. So thank you for explaining the difference there for us. Just one point. Somebody had asked, uh, "What's um, what was number four again?" Uh, just to repeat, what do you remember? What number four was? Prototype. Prototype. Yeah. Okay, that was for Natalia. Um, it's it's really it's it's a it's really fun, right? So like with one of my with my higher level English classes, I actually have them create a product, and they actually build the product, right? And I give all the students. We pretend that we're a business. Um, I'm I teach at Stanford, so I'm right here in the heart of Silicon Valley. And I have them create products. They can create whatever they want, but they have to, you know, use the vocabulary that I taught for advertising and business words and so on. And then they go with their group and actually build something. And then they try to sell it to the other groups and everybody gets fake money and we invest in the, in the products. Where in project-based learning, I would just have them create a poster. Like they could just draw it or explain it just as good, but they don't actually create something. That's the biggest difference for me. That's how I kind of wrap my mind around it. Um, Robin, how does someone take a concept like design thinking? Um, you mentioned so, some examples for how like adults or higher level students might do it, but what if you're working with um, children or lower literacy students? How would you, how would a teacher implement something like that into the classroom? 
Uh, I think there's a lot of ways, right? And I, I think one thing we need to remember when I first started doing all my research and and flipping my classroom, one thing, one lesson I learned very quickly was start small. Like you don't have to just jump all in and decide. I mean, I didn't decide one day, hey, I think I'll flip my class tomorrow. I did it in small baby steps. And I think we can, you know, kind of implement project-based learning and design thinking the same way. Um, but I have some friends who teach at like the K-6 level, so elementary, and they do design thinking. Um, one of the, I think, I want to say it's a popular product project because I've heard about it more than once, is the ramen noodle project. Everybody calls it the ramen noodle project. Um, and it, basically, how do you take this quick and easy meal and make it nutritious, right? So we would teach the vocabulary we need for nutrition on health classes. Um, and students then could think of ways, right? That's the, the big question. How do you make this nutritious? And students would come up with a variety of ways to make ramen noodles more nutritious. That's a very small, but very simple way to do project-based learning or design thinking. Um, others are, you know, redesign a room. You can just have students redesign your classroom. In their mind, what would be the ideal classroom? Should there be groups of chairs over here? Should we have a big center area? They redesign the classroom. Um, another really popular one is the gift giving project where students have to, the research question is kind of how do you design a good or meaningful gift for someone that you, you know, I mean, they're not, it's, it's, it can be simple. Yeah, those are some fantastic examples. Thanks. I think at least that gets people um, generating some ideas, right? And Tara, I'm guessing that as you're hearing this, you're also generating ideas. Um, you're you're the one creating materials. So how do you go about creating materials when you hear new ideas like this? Yeah, we are a small team. And we've always been a small like publishing team, but part of that is just great because honestly, we don't wait a long time. And unlike in a traditional publisher where you, you know, you have to work it out with a big group and decide on something and get your schedule ready for the following year. Um, we do plan a year ahead and a month ahead, but the difference for us is that we make changes on the fly. And so um, we're just trying to fill those demands quickly um, when things are relevant, because like anything, trends change and how we teach change. And we learn so much just in one day that can apply to our materials um, and we're all listening and um, being involved. So that is definitely something that we have going for us at ESL Library is that we are just always, you know, adapting our materials, but also just coming up with new ideas and changing them based on what teachers need, what students need and what the trends are for sure. With all these new ideas, how do you prioritize? <laughs> Oh, so we do, uh, you know, we get those plus one, plus one, plus one <laughs> requests from teachers. We definitely rely on that. Um, um, a little bit of it is just monthly meetings and chatting with each other and trying to decide, you know, what what's the most important thing to do right now. Um, we, we do track um, searches. So we're constantly looking at, you know, what are teachers searching for that they can't actually find on our site. So that's a really useful thing that, you know, some traditional publishers maybe can't do. But at ESL Library, it's easy for us to say, what are teachers looking for? Oh, they want information like on family. And, you know, we've got so much content on family, but maybe we don't have it for higher levels. So we were able to, you know, add new materials based on what they're searching for at the time. Maybe we're a two weeks or three weeks behind, but we're definitely never a year behind. Awesome. Ben, um, do you feel like the ed tech space is able to keep up with these changing needs that teachers have or these changing ideas that teachers have? Um, where, where are we from an ed tech perspective on managing this? I think a lot of the time it's trying to catch up um, to the needs. It seems like reactive instead of proactive. Um, and um, but it is getting easier to be reactive quicker than in the past. You know, it's getting easier to build technology faster and get it out the door faster. Whereas, you know, before to build an app or a tool of some kind might might have taken years to build it. Um, but now, uh, coding language is um, uh, much more advanced, and we can develop things much faster. Um, and so, I think that. I think that 
um, it's important to be proactive and to think ahead and maybe to innovate and, and build a, a new tool that nobody's using yet. But I think a lot of the time the trends do get set or the, as I spoke of yesterday, the, the needs um, of teachers um, are really only known by the teachers first. And a lot of times it has to be reactive um, and has to be a, a game of catch up. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of making sure that once a need is identified um, to, to build a tool um, or an app of some kind uh, or a feature uh, that's going to um, that's going to serve those needs. And you know when COVID hit, um, we had a small um, digital tool uh, on the platform. Um, it was a, a homework tool, it wasn't being used that much. And when it, when it hit, we um, we had all sorts of server issues um, and uh, with people using it more frequently, we had to react to that. But at the same time, we very quickly started to hear from teachers about what types of tasks were missing in digital, what types of features were missing. And I think we're playing that same kind of game uh, that the uh, publishing team is playing on the technology side where um, our road, we've got a roadmap and we've got things and ideas that we want to do long term. But every week we are uh, changing that roadmap by listening to um, uh, what uh, teachers are requesting. And we really can't know that unless we're in the classroom. So we're reacting uh, based on uh, uh, feedback from teachers. Do you, uh, with the design thinking and project-based learning, those require a lot of collaboration from, you know, between students. Do you think that technology, education technology is at a place where it can support that kind of, um, that kind of learning digitally? Yeah, there's a lot of companies that do, or there's companies that are getting really good at that, um, uh, at, at this sort of collaboration tools. And even from just like the general ones like Zoom, um, but there's also other companies that are focusing on collaboration right now and just as their specialty. And I think they're gonna get better and better at. I hope that we are not, um, I hope that we are not just consistently learning online into the future uh, as the only way of learning. I hope um, uh, that there's a lot of uh, classrooms that open up back up again soon. Um, but I think that regardless, there's going to be a lot of work that's done at home, a lot of homework, and a lot of collaboration is going to be needed whether you're in class or not. And I think that those uh, that, that companies are getting better and better at building collaboration tools and more also more receptive, not just receptive to it, but more um, uh, understanding of the fact that it is desperately needed right now. So you will start to see um, better tools for collaboration every day. That's hopeful. <laughs> Um, you mentioned that, you know, we're listening to teachers and we want to hear them. How how do you go about um, learning from teachers and what they currently need and um, what more could ed tech companies be doing to hear from teachers? Um, what can they be doing to, 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 to listen better? Sorry, I was also reading another question. Was <laughs> yeah, <be> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the question is like, how, how is ESL library learning what teachers need and then what more could be done? Yeah, so we learn through a few ways, through surveys um, uh, or through reaching out. Before COVID, we used to fly out to schools all across um, uh, North America, and we would sit down in person with teachers and administrators or groups of, of teachers, and we would show our product, and then we would ask, what are we doing right? And what are we doing wrong? And what are we missing? And we did that both from the publishing side and the, and the tech side. We haven't been able to do that for the last couple of years, but we've been trying to do that um, online a bit more. Um, and uh, listening to, to, to emails, um, uh, I think that it's really, e email is an, an old uh, uh, form of communication online, but it's a really effective one. And uh, a lot of companies, tech companies, don't pay enough attention to sort of customer support and emails. And we've got an amazing customer support team and we've, um, uh, we've spent a lot of time really trying to um, uh, build a team that could react and, and respond to those uh, questions. Every month we have a town hall with our customer support team where they uh, spend an hour or two hours even sometimes meeting with the publishers and the developers to sit down and tell them all of the things that are coming in, all the questions that are coming in, all the demands that are coming in, all the problems and pain points that are coming in from, from customers. Uh, from teachers and and the publishing team and the development team reacts to that and listens to that. We can't always get to all of those things, but it helps. So I think that all companies should sort of take that approach. 
Awesome. I'm seeing a lot of a lot of love for our uh, support team over there in the chat too. So thanks for that. Yeah, they are an incredible team. Um, and Tara, from a from a publishing perspective, how are you connecting with teachers to hear what their needs are? Um, do you like hearing from teachers? You know, what are yeah, just I think teachers wonder sometimes. Do you want to hear my ideas? And if so, how do they, how do they do that? Absolutely. Yeah. When we were a small, very small team, there were, you know, maybe six of us. And so we were making the materials, editing the materials and answering all the questions. And we were very close to the customer um, growing. That's been one of the, you know, challenges is just making sure that we're still close with the customer. So we have some amazing um, staff that are just our liaisons and they, you know, are in constant communication with us daily about just specific requests coming in. But also just um, our blog is a great way to have a little community with us. So our editors, our writers, um, our marketing team, they're all teachers, we're all teachers. We, that's how we started out. And so um, that's another great way to communicate with us and let us know what you need. Um, we've started a new for students um, category even, so the students can even get involved with us and let us know, you know what they're looking for or what they want or just you know, we can actually just see just by communicating with them kind of what they might need. So that's another great spot, the blog. Um, it's really been a focus for us this year, trying to bring it back and um, it's getting really good. I'm really excited about it. Social media, so we have whatever your favorite social media is, you know, we're there for you. LinkedIn is one of the biggest ones right now, I find for just professional development. Um, it really used to be Twitter in the ELT industry. Um, for me specifically, that's where I feel like I met all the great minds of ELT. It was through Twitter, you know, even went to Aya Tefl based on, you know, learning, um, you know, filling a need there, um, chatting with people. So, but I think it's moved over to LinkedIn. That's, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Um, and I learned so much through LinkedIn and we can, you know, just have one-on-ones with the teachers and subscribers. So, I hope to see some of you guys there. Um, definitely conferences is probably still my number one choice for meeting teachers and talking with them and finding out what they need. I really miss those in-person ones, but I, I found even the social tables here were a great you know, resource for, for us to go in and answer some questions and find out what, what teachers need. So, you know, there, there's something to be said for an online conference. Uh, we're getting a lot out of this and we got a lot out of TESOL as well, so. Tara, do you have like um, one concrete example or two of something that a teacher recommended or a tutor recommended or a librarian recommended um, to the team that we've implemented? Oh, for sure. There's probably a million. Um, definitely our Washington Post section is, you know, getting a lot of love right now. Um, it's just a new thing for us, having a partner. Um, so we can put out one less than a week based on um, a real article from the Washington Post. Um, we're a little bit limited what we can do with it, but um, as far as the, the content, we have access to a lot of it. We don't have access to all of it, but we do have access to a lot of it. So uh, at first when we started putting out content, we were kind of experimenting and the teachers were writing in and saying, oh, we want to see more international news. So, you know, we, we started covering a lot more international news. And then teachers are writing in and saying, oh, actually, my students are so tired of talking about COVID. You know, we put out so many lessons and resources related to COVID because they didn't have that vocabulary. We didn't even have the vocabulary. Um, so then, you know, we did a little bit of, you know, stepping away from that topic for a while and did some little lighter, you know, lighter topics. So that's definitely something that, you know, we've been experimenting with. Great examples. Um, Robin, sorry, you've been a little bit neglected here. <laughs> No um, I, I'm seeing in the chat and I just know in general that teachers um, sometimes feel unheard. We're getting a lot of love saying that, you know, ESL library is very responsive and that's very sweet and we do our best at that. But in general, um, you know, I've been a teacher. We've Many of us have been teachers here. Uh, teachers feel unheard sometimes. And I'm saying teacher, I, this includes tutors and volu literacy volunteers. I'm, I'm using one term to kind of keep from having to say all of those, but um, all of those are teachers. So how do, how do teachers um, connect with companies? How do they connect and help make their voice heard? Because companies do want to hear. 
I, I think that's true. I mean, I've been I've been a teacher my whole career. I'm the product of two teachers. My parents were both career teachers. Um, I think there is power in numbers. And I do think that the publishers having, I mean, I've written textbooks and so I've worked with publishers from, from that perspective as well. I think they do want to hear from us. And I do think there is something to be said for power in numbers. Um, so I think we need to be active in our organizations. Um, TESOL, IATEFL, ACTFL, whatever, you know, whatever professional organization for your region. And it doesn't have to be the national TESOL or the international TESOL. I mean, local regional TESOLs in whatever country you're in or whatever part of the United States you're in. Work and be, you know, be active. It's great if you want to take on a leadership role, but it's more just about being active. Um, TESOL, for example, has all of these listservs and teacher, if we all, you know, chime in on those, I know the publishers read those. The publishers are all members of TESOL and they read that. And if a lot of us are saying something on a listserv, that eventually turns in to materials and it gets us in touch with the right people. So I think it's just about, you know, being active. And once, you know, you get a small contingent of people that agree with you, it grows. And again, get the word out, use those listservs, publish on TESOL blogs, um, the ESL library blog, P take, take advantage of publishing. It doesn't have to be a journal article. Um, boy, I'm a teacher, I know how busy we all are. But you know, a simple listserv or a blog posting, all of that is a great way to you know, get your needs out there. And you'll find out there, you know, misery loves company. If you know if something's been really hard, there, uh, there, the rest of us probably feel the same way and we will respond to that. Great, yeah, and just, you know, as a teacher myself too, I was initially a little bit intimidated to get it, to get involved with other TESOL communities. And I learned that um, I'm in California, there's the big California TESOL, but they're also like regional small groups. And I think that ties into the idea of um, something we were talking about earlier in the day, which is the social emotional learning and supporting ourselves as teachers and building that social network and connection with other educators. So if you can get involved in those, it kind of, you know, it serves two roles, it gives you a sense of community, but it also, um, it helps you make your voice louder and you can connect with, you know, ed, with ed tech companies and with publishers and um, it just amplifies your voice a little more and makes you feel not so alone. Um, let's see, do we have any questions? I'm. Do we have time for questions? You guys up for that? Yeah, we yeah. love questions. Okay, yeah, we love questions. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share one. This is actually for you, Robin. It's a little bit earlier. I'm gonna show this on stage real quick. Um, so they've tried flipped classrooms, but a consistent issue is students not doing the pre-class work. And do you have any strategies for that? Oh, so many strategies for that. Um, yes, and that, Pam, I see her name is Pam. Pam, if I don't answer this question because we have such a short time, e email me later and I'll give my email at the end or I can have somebody give you my email so that we can talk more about this. But I think one of the really important things to remember about flip learning is you're really, you know, you're really flipping Bloom's taxonomy. So you have to make sure that the homework, the homework doesn't need to be long or and it most definitely shouldn't be hard. It should be at the lowest level of Bloom's taxonomy. So if it's short and accessible, then I don't really have trouble getting students to do it. Um, and it doesn't need to research. I've done so much research on this. Research shows that it doesn't have to be any more than 10 minutes. When students realize that the homework is actually shorter in a flipped classroom and easier in a flipped classroom, they tend to do it more readily. So that's a really that's a really quick short answer, but I could talk for hours. Don't let me do that. Yeah, that's <laughs> perfect. And we had a whole session about um, blended flip learning yesterday, and all of these sessions are being recorded, and they'll be made available to you after um, the event. So if you missed out, don't worry. Um, let's see if we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, here's another one related to flipped classrooms. I'm very popular. I'm going to go ahead and show this on stage. So the question is, what do you think about focusing on reviewing rather than using a flipped classroom strategy? Well, I think that I think one of the 
main premises behind the flipped classroom is that the whole the whole thing is reviewing. It's making sure that students not just understand the content, but review it and are able to use it. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm completely understanding the question, Natalia. So if I'm not, again, email me. I'm happy to talk offline. Um, but your your pre you know your pre work could be a simple review, right? It could be a ten question multiple choice quiz over what you did in class to review what they've already done. Again, making them then more likely to do the homework, but also making sure that they understood. Or you could make whatever you do in the classroom would be a review of whatever that homework assignment was. Perfect. And I think Russell mentioned, I think it was Russell who was saying that, you know, the flip classroom or blended learning, there's like three parts to it. There's the pre-assigned work, then there's the in-class work, and then there, you can also do the review. So it doesn't have to be one or the other. Um, it, right. Yeah. Flip um, learning is really versatile. I mean, I didn't know that. I think there's kind of, there's, I, I wrote a small ebook on flip learning, kind of about the myth, right? Because I, I wrote, I wrote my first book on flip learning and then realized, wow, there's just a lot of myths. Like there's these ideas that people think about flip learning and it's not, it's, it's not as, it's not as hard as you think. And start small. I started small. I'm going to show, this is, I'm not sure this is exactly a question, but I'm going to share this anyway. Um, Diana mentioned that she teaches a multi-level classroom of adult ESL uh, learners, and she has homework in class as a warm-up or a group collaboration. So it's not really homework um, because they have families and work. So she basically just does homework in class. So. I think that's, that's absolutely true. And I think Again, one of the, you know, the myths I tried to dispel when I was doing my research is there's more than one way to flip a classroom. And really what you're kind of doing here in that question, it sounds a little bit like what we call the in-class flip. And so there is, you know, there is a flip learning methodology that never leaves the classroom. And that's what I used actually in my, I, I used to teach adult education before I moved to California. And I still volunteer at the adult ed center, go adult ed. and you could flip there and you, I, I recognize my students there, they're, they go home to their children and their, and their jobs. So I did all flipping, but I just do it inside the classroom. It can be contained. You don't need to do the homework portion. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, Tara, here's an interesting comment or question that was made in the chat. And I just found again, <laughs> I'm going to show this on stage for you. Um, it's a question for the publishing team of how do you go about developing sensitive material? So in, she's in Canada and the first nation's material on every child matters. I thought that was a great question. Yeah, this is such an important topic right now. And it's actually one of the calls to action, if you're familiar with it, that um, newcomers to Canada are educated in this type of content. Um, I was actually tweeting with our MP about this <laughs> recently, um, just asking, you know, where we're at with it. But it's really important. We want to be part of this. Um, we get a lot of requests for materials related to this, and we take it, you know, very seriously. In fact, somebody yesterday noted that we had the the name of the the tr the new holiday that we have. Um, the name of it we had of instead of. I forget which word it was, but we had it wrong. And so, you know, we were able to quickly fix that. And we were discussing, should we do this tonight? We'll do it in the morning. Um, so it's really important. We know vocabulary, how we how we use the vocabulary is very um, different in Canada and in the US. And also we have a British English editor who uh, makes sure that it's being used properly um, based on the audience. So um, that's really important to us, especially to our editors, and they're very careful about that. And, you know, sometimes it's the teachers that write in and say, oh, but what about this or what about that? Um, as you know, we have many, many, many hundreds of lessons. And so we have to be careful and mindful of how the language changes. Um, so, yeah, it, it's a challenge to address it and keep it up to date, but it's really important to us. But another another thing, I don't know if we still have time on that, but just um, uh, for one one moment on that is that we, we do um, have a lot of content on sensitive issues. Um, and I think, though, um, what's important is that it always comes down 
it should always come down to the teacher as to whether or not um, this content is appropriate in your class. Um, so we make stuff that we know is not going to be appropriate in some classes and might be in others. Um, and we know it's going to be far too sensitive um, in, in one area versus another. Um, but we do it because we know that sometimes teachers really do want to discuss a particular topic or a particular issue. And um, really, it boils down to the, the teacher deciding, looking at the material first and, and making a judgment call as to whether or not this is appropriate. Um, and we put the material out there and then we leave it to the teacher to decide. And sometimes as well, um, our material may seem slanted one way or another too. And um, uh, it's important that a teacher takes the time to uh, look over it and decide whether or not um, that slant may be effective uh, or may, may, may cause some sort of issue in the class as well. So we have some cool. new dis uh, teacher discretion labels as well that are fairly new and that came in based on teacher requests. Sometimes there's like something small, a small activity or a discussion question that might make you uncomfortable or might make your students uncomfortable, even just the mention of alcohol. Some teachers can't, you know, use that lesson. So we've started adding teacher discretion labels um, to our materials just so that give teachers a little head up, heads up to review this. We hope that they'll preview the material before they use it, but it's not always possible to read everything. So that's something we've done recently. Yeah, I'll try to show that in uh, the Lunch and Learn demo that it will be coming up right next. So I'll make a point to highlight that. Uh, remind me if I don't, someone hop on and tell me. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, well, I would like to just thank everyone. We're out of time here. I really appreciated everyone's comments and questions. You're so engaged. I think this is um, a topic that's just really helpful for everyone to learn what, you know, what people are talking about. If we haven't heard of these terms before, we can go out and learn a little bit about them ourselves and, you know, incorporate them into our classroom if it makes sense for our students and our students' needs, right? So we're not just going to go pursue this for the sake of pursuing it. It needs to make sense to our students, but hopefully that inspires you. And thank you, Ben and Tara, for giving us that behind the scenes kind of look into what, um, how an idea that teachers are talking about goes into actually being creative. Um, so thanks for taking that time, everyone.